Welcome to this video assignment on the Spanish Empire. This video assignment is designed for Mr. Eads' History 1301 class at North Central Texas College and is to be used for in preparation for the Module 1 exam. Thus, students, if you've not done so already, please go back to Canvas and download the review sheets that connect with this video assignment as it will help you follow along in the video assignment and the review sheets will also help you prepare for the Module 1 exam on which there will be questions from this assignment for. This video assignment is on the Spanish Empire and discussing a brief overview of it. By the middle of the 16th century, Spain had established an immense empire that reached from Europe to the Americas and Asia. In the Americas, it stretched from the Andes Mountains of South America through present-day Mexico and the Caribbean and eventually into Florida and the southwestern United States, including Texas and California. To put this into perspective, Spain claimed more territory at the time than had the Romans in the Roman Empire of, of, the, of ancient times. Now the center of Spain's North American Empire was at Mexico City, which was built on the ruins of Tenochtitlan. Mexico City boasted churches, hospitals, monasteries, government buildings, and the New World's first university. The Real Colegio de Santa Cruz. For the most part, Spanish America, or the Spanish Empire, was an urban civilization. And what I mean by that is that it was an empire of towns. For centuries, the towns of the Spanish Empire, the great cities, notably Mexico City, Quito, which is in Ecuador, and Lima, which is in Peru, far outshone any urban centers in North America. And, and even most of those in Europe. Now, Spain's system of colonial government and managing their Spanish empire, it rivaled that of ancient Rome. In theory, the government of Spanish America reflected the absolutism of the newly united kingdom at home on the Iberian Peninsula. Authority in the Spanish empire originated with the king, and it flowed downward through the Council of the Indies which was the main body in Spain for colonial administration. And then it flowed to direct viceroys in Mexico and Peru and other local officials. The Roman Catholic Church exerted its authority on matters of faith, morals, and treatment of the Indians. Royal officials were generally appointees from Spain rather than Spaniards born in the Americas. At first, the imperial state at home maintained a real and continuous presence in Spanish America. But as, its as Spain's power declined in Europe, beginning in the 17th century, the local elite in the Americas came to enjoy more and more effective authority over colonial affairs. The Economy of, Spanish, of the Spanish Empire The establishment of Spain's American Empire transformed the balance of power in the world economy. Atlantic trade routes replaced the overland route to Asia as the major access of global trade. And finally, Christians had a trade route that wasn't dominated by Muslims. Historian Alfred Crosby described this as the Columbian Exchange, which is the transatlantic flow of goods and services between the two worlds, between the old and the new, and the new and the old. New products were brought to the old world, as well as new products brought to the new world. Products introduced to Europe from America included corn, tomatoes, potatoes, peanuts, tobacco, and cotton. And I mention this because if I mention tomatoes to you, I'm sure you immediately think Italy. Or if I, think, or if I say potatoes to you, you probably automatically think Ireland. But these products were not native to Italy or Ireland. Instead, they came from the Americas and, to, and just sprouted tomatoes in, in Italy and the potatoes in Ireland. In exchange, the New World received wheat, rice, sugarcane, horses, cattle, pigs, and sheep. Those all came from the Old World. Cattle, horses, and sheep are not native to the New World. And then last but not least, the New World received something else from the Old. Disease. Because of their contact with Europeans, the Native American population suffered a catastrophic decline. 
Overall, it's estimated that 80 million people died due to disease in the first 150 years of contact with the Europeans. This, at the time, this equates to close to one-fifth of mankind. And this, and this devastation by disease of the Native Americans in this first century and a half of contact, it represents the absolute greatest loss of life in human history. Just by contrast, World War II cost 50 million lives. As a, and this, this Holocaust cost perhaps 80 million. Thus, it was disease as much, if not more so, the military prowess and more advanced technology that enabled the Europeans to conquer the Americas. Their secret weapon was disease. Despite the decline of the Indian population due to disease, however, Spanish America remained populous enough that, with the exception of the West Indies and a few cities, large-scale importations of African slaves was not necessary, at least at the beginning. Instead, the Spanish forced tens of thousands of Indians to work in the gold and the silver mines, which supplied the Spanish Empire with its wealth. And on large-scale farms, called haciendas, that were controlled by Spanish landlords. Unlike other New World empires, Indians performed more of the labor, and although the Spanish introduced livestock to the New World, and along with wheat and sugar, the main agricultural crop remained corn, beans, and squash. 1537, Pope Paul III outlawed the enslavement of Indians. Now, Pope Paul III did this because he hoped it would bring, it would help the Indians become devout subjects of Roman Catholicism and devout subjects of Catholic monarchs. From a practical standpoint, enslaving the Indians proved to be difficult as they could run away and never come back. Fifteen years after Pope Paul made this declaration, Dominican priest Bartolome de las Casas published an account of the decimation of the Indian population in a pamphlet called A Very Brief Account of the Destruction of the Indies. Las Casas' writings denounce the Spanish Empire for causing the death of millions of innocent people. Las Casas insisted that the Indians were rational human beings. They were not savages. They were not barbarians. And that Spain had no grounds on which to deprive them of their lands and liberty. Yet, La Casas also suggested in this pamphlet that a much better idea for Spain would be to import slaves from Africa. And that would help protect, and in La Casas' mind, African slavery would protect the Indians from exploitation. Thus, put it real simply, what causes is substituting one ethnic group for another here. Largely because of Lacasse's efforts, in 1542, Spain proclaimed new laws, commanding that Indians no longer be enslaved. In 1550, Spain abolished the Incosamina system, under which the first settlers, the conquistadors and the soldiers, had been granted authority over conquered Indian lands with the right to extract labor from the natives. Taking the Incosamina's system's place is the Repartimentio system. It still required labor from the Indians, but allowed them to be legally free and with the right to earn wages. By the end of the 16th century, work in the Spanish Empire consisted largely of forced wage labor by the Indians and slave labor by the Africans on the West Indian Islands and a few parts of the mainland. Like other empires, Spain's empire was exploitive. But the Spanish government barred non-Spaniards from immigrating to the, its American domains, as well as non-Christian Spaniards at first. This also included Jews and Muslims. But the opportunity for social advancement was so great in the Spanish empire that it drew numerous colonists from Spain. 225,000 in the 16th century, and 750,000 overall in all three centuries of Spain's colonial rule. Eventually, a significant number of colonists came in family groups. But at first, the, col the main Spanish colonists 
were young single men, many of them laborers, craftsmen, and soldiers, all seeking economic opportunity. Many came over as government officials, priests, professionals, all ready to direct the manual work of Indians, since in Spain's mind, in the Spani Spaniard's mind, living without having to labor was a sign of nobility. Nobles didn't have to work. The most successful of these colonists enjoyed lives of luxury that was similar to the upper classes at home. Economic opportunity was here in the Spanish Empire. However, the Indian population of Spanish America greatly outnumbered European colonists and their descendants. Thus, large areas in the Spanish Empire remained effectively under local Indian control for many years. Spanish authorities granted Indians certain rights within colonial society and looked forward to the Indians' eventual assimilation. Indeed, as it turns out, the success of the Spanish Empire in the Americas depended on the nature of the native societies on which it could build. And overall, you're looking at a hybrid culture here. The Spanish crown eventually ordered colonists to bring their wives with them to America, and demanded that single men marry as well. But with the population of Spanish women remaining low in the Spanish Empire, the intermixing of colonial and Indian peoples soon began. As early as 1514, the Spanish government formally approved of such marriages between Native Americans and Spaniards. Over time, Spanish America, the Spanish Empire, evolves into a hybrid culture that is part Spanish, part Indian, and in some areas, part African, but with a single faith, Roman Catholicism, a single language, Spanish, and a single governmental system, the Repartimentio system, with Spanish authority, come, with direct authority coming directly from Madrid. Thank you for watching this video assignment on the Spanish Empire, and may the force be with you.